Hello, and welcome to another off-the-shelf podcast from the Conference Board. My name is Rebecca Ray, and I'm the Executive Vice President for Human Capital here at the Conference Board. I'm very excited to uh, be here today with Ron Williams, who's the author of a brand new book on learning to lead. It's available in bookstores now, and I've uh, spent some some time uh, really trying to absorb the many lessons that are in there, and I think this is going to be uh, d- just a, a wonderful uh, time together. You know, Ron Williams is best known for his leadership at Aetna, where he transformed a $292 million operating loss into a $2 billion in annual earnings. Ron serves as the chairman and CEO of RW2 Enterprises, and he also serves as a director for American Express, Boeing, and Johnson & Johnson. His MS in management is from the Sloan School of Management at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Ron serves as a trustee here at the conference board, and he and I have had the pleasure to work uh, together on some research around millennial leaders and how they may or or may not uh, be different from the leaders uh, that we have come to know and embrace. Uh, and he was the executive sponsor of that, and, and through that, there were some really terrific insights. So it's just been a pleasure, and now I'm so excited to speak with Ron for just a little bit uh, on his exciting new book. Ron, thank you so much for, for coming and, and spending a little bit of time with me today. This is all very exciting. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you. And, you know, I, I think um, as I read the manuscript, there were so many things that I pulled from that, some of which I've heard you speak about in other settings, uh, but so many of them were the very personal stories your, about your own journey. And, and yours is a, is a very American story about aspiration, about dedication, about hard work, about making sure that every opportunity counted. And how would you respond to those who believe that it's no longer possible in America today? Well, one, I would say that they're wrong. I think that there is an enormous opportunity for individuals who want to transform themselves into leaders or improve their circumstances. And maybe we'll get a chance to talk about how I think they can do that. You know, the book is structured into three sections very consciously. The first section is really about leading yourself. And that section is really focused on the young person who really can't quite figure out where they want to go or how they can get there. And then the second section is really about learning to lead other people, and that's for for professionals who've been very successful, but who all of a sudden find themselves not high-performing individual contributors, but now leading teams. And the final section is really about leading organizations, whether they be for-profit or not-for-profit, with the notion that there are certain things that only the CEO of of the organization can do. You know, Ron, as I I read the book, um, it is cleanly in three different sections, sort of stages of a career, and yet there are things that unite them, sort of connective tissue, if you will, that's throughout a, a leader's journey. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I would say that one of the things I learned in writing the book was to appreciate that connectivity, that it's not as if you go through a phase and you're done with those competencies. And, and you move on to, to the next phase of your career. For example, when you become a CEO or a C-suite executive, it turns out that one of the single most important sections is the section on leading yourself. Because the higher you go in the organization, the less constraints you have, the broader the implications of your de- decisions, and the more you have to be thoughtful about all of your actions. And, and I think, you know, in that first section about leading yourself, great messages around self-control. I, I loved the section on assuming positive intent and how that serves, uh, serves leaders well and, and continuing, continuing to, to improve on an interpersonal basis. You talked a little bit about knowing yourself well enough to determine if you're a SEAL or a sailor. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I I would um, talk about that. Uh, It's really a a very important concept, but I I would also stress that early in career, one of the most important ideas people need to commit to is a notion of being better. And I talk about it myself as as an objective every year to be 15% better. And that's not because you can actually do that each and every year, but it requires enough self-reflection and self-awareness to really think about what do you really have to do to move in the direction of your goals. Now, 
being a sailor or a SEAL is extremely important, and most of us think about Navy SEALs, and we have a sense that it's a very arduous training program. They commit to do absolutely heroic things. On the other hand, you can join the Navy and you can be a sailor, and you can have a great career. You are expected to perform certain duties effectively. But if you're a Navy SEAL and you spend all your time working with Navy sailors, you will be unhappy. On the other hand, if you're a sailor and they throw you into the Navy SEALs, you're going to be extremely unhappy. And so this whole notion is about recognizing what you want to do, what commitments you're willing to make to the organization and the projects, but also to recognize that throughout life, there are times you want to be a SEAL, there are times you want to be a sailor. And organizations have to recognize that people need the ability to move back and forth through those two different states. Well, that does require a reflection ability and also probably an evolved soul. And um, But I think I'd be curious to know how you can suggest to folks that they can determine whether or not they've made the progress that they aspire to. So if 15% improvement is the goal, you know, how would they go about determining whether or not they'd hit it? Well, I, I think what, what happens is um, you have to really set very measurable and quantifiable goals. I'll give you just an example. When I was CEO of Aetna, one of the things that I set as a goal was to increase our global footprint. And I really, we had been mostly a domestic company because healthcare is very unique to the U.S. and typically unique to the cultural and his, his historical legacy in most countries. But it was important that we move outside of the U.S. So I committed to do that. I spent a lot of time in India, in the U.K., in China, trying to figure out what our strategy should be, what initiatives we should look at, what acquisitions we should make. At the end of that year, I asked myself, had I, in fact, achieved that particular objective? And I felt that we had. We had a clear sense of the capability. It's also important to be public with your objectives because that helps create another level of, of accountability. You know, in the leading yourself, I would think some of that reflection, the ability to know whether or not you had indeed, you know, hit some of those quantifiable goals, some of it may not be as tangible, perhaps, as some other things. and. And I would think that listening to the feedback of others is critical here. And, and you talked a lot in that first section around being able to not only ask effective questions, but also to make the, a comfortable space for people to be candid, but also to listen. And and that to me seems like just sides of the same, same picture, if you will. W would you s speak to that? Yeah, well, I, I, I think I heard it best when someone said that uh, we, we had two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> and that learning to listen, to accept feedback, to seek out feedback, and to create an environment, and in some sense, a group of advisors, of people who may have more experience that you can, and who can help you as you think about important decisions in your life. Self-awareness, understanding what you're good at, understanding what you're not good at, understanding what you need to improve at, is fundamentally important, but you can't get there if you aren't open to feedback and recognize that people often have your best interest at heart when, when they give you things you might view as criticisms. Yeah, and I think it makes a big difference when people offer you feedback, which sometimes can be hard to hear, if they think that the person giving that feedback already has a relationship with someone, it's going to be seen through the lens of, I'm, I'm, I'm there for you and I have your best interest at heart, and that to me then kind of sets up a dynamic where you can say a lot of things to someone because they know the, the framework through which you're coming. And I think that's why it's important to build this group of personal advisors, of, of people who you see regularly, you have trust and confidence in, who maybe they may all come from different perspectives, be further along in their career than you are, but who can really give you honest feedback. You, you may think something you've written is the absolute best thing you've ever written. <laughs> they may read it and give you mm -hmm. some feedback that you might view as criticism, yeah. but they're speaking from experience and what they believe is really yeah. a good high quality product. And that just speaks to your, your comment about building those relationships of trust. Extremely so important. Yeah. So when you think about leading others, another you know section of the book, uh, you talked about the fact that uh, both you and, and Ken Chenault, the former uh, chairman and CEO at American Express, mm -hmm. share a philosophy 
uh, from a famous uh, French general. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and I have to credit Ken on this because Ken is really where I, 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 I picked it up. And, and I think I always believed in the concepts. I felt that his use of Napoleon's quote really summarized it very succinctly. And that the leader's job is to really understand the environment in which the organization or the department is operating, to really coldly and dispassionately look at the reality that is being faced. And in doing that, to restructure, arrange, focus the organization on how it can be successful in that environment. And I think the second thing that uh, Napoleon talked about is, an, is the ability to give the organization hope and the group hope. And so when you really confront, for example, that you have products that are not doing well in the market, why are those products not doing well in the market? And when you go out and you talk to customers and you get an outside-in view and you have a, a reality that maybe it's product quality, maybe it's product price, once you identify that, then you can go to work to fix those problems. And the hope comes from the link between this true understanding of what it takes to achieve success, the actions that you're taking that give people confidence that there will be a better tomorrow. I think that's terrific. I'll probably steal that idea and <laughs> just use the quote. But you know, it seems to me that's not that dissimilar from the way you give performance feedback. If you can help people see the reality, but also give them hope. I think so many times in a performance review, we've told people maybe all the things that they should fix to be a better human being, which is, which is swell, but we leave them there as opposed to saying, and now I'll be your partner in taking this you know, in a different direction. So. Um, I, I just think that's just a great way to frame it. Um, can I ask about your your thoughts on, as a leader, how you inspire uh, trust and how do you build that culture so that people feel as though they can be candid, they can bring you bad news, they can bring you things that, you know, are risky for them. And what, 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 How do you consciously do that as a leader? There's several techniques that a leader can use. Um, one I'll talk about is using a trusted advisor. I always had someone who worked for me whose job it was to keep their pulse on what the organization was thinking. And I had a rule, I want to know what the organization is saying and thinking. I do not want to know who is saying it or thinking it. Oh, I do want to know if it's a credible organiz a credible person mm -hmm. who's a high performer, committed to our goals and what we're trying to do, or whether it's an outlier perspective. And what you find is you have to really have tentacles because leaders are often the last to know. And the second thing I would say is you have to establish forms and formats where the staff can ask questions, and you have to really create an environment where all questions are accepted and, and people are comfortable asking them. When I first joined Aetna, uh, I had, uh, was doing my town hall meetings, and I went to Chicago, and I explained what our strategy was, where we were going, what we were doing, and one woman stood up and said, you seem like a very nice man, you are the fifth person we've had here in three years who's trying to help us improve, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Why should we, in fact, commit to what you're asking us to do? The first thing I did was, was pause and say, I want everyone to stand up and give that person a round of applause for asking the question that was on everyone's mind, but only she had the courage. So you have to demonstrate in openness and willingness and then you have to give sincere, practical, realistic answers, not double talk. And that does take courage. But as a leader, for you to have made the space for someone to be able to feel like they could step in, that probably sent a lot of really positive messages for a long time to, yeah. and to folks. I, I think also in today's world, you have to be open to multiple ways of communication. I had something called Ask Ron. Anyone could send a question in, every question got an answer. And I would tell people, I will answer the question. You may or may not like the answer, but you will get an answer and an explanation. Well, well that's, that's quite a commitment for any leader to make. To a, to, to display that kind of openness, and secondly, to say, in any way you want to have a conversation or get information and feedback, I'm here. 
Well, we're going to take a, a short break for a couple of announcements, and then we'll come right back. I hope you'll uh, stay with us, and uh, we'll be right back. Looking for additional insights beyond this podcast? The Conference Board hosts an array of annual seminars and conferences on a wide selection of topics, ranging from engagement to strategic HR, talent management, leadership, and diversity and inclusion. Learn best practices from top companies and hear insights from renowned practitioners and thought leaders, all while having the opportunity to network and collaborate with your peers. For a complete list of our upcoming programs, you can visit us at www.conferenceboard.org slash events. And as an added thank you for listening to this program, use code POD300 to save $300 off your registration. That's P-O-D 300. Seats fill up quickly, so visit our website and reserve your spot today. And so we're back. Uh, I'm uh, Rebecca Ray, and I'm here today with Ron Williams. He's the author of a brand new book, uh, from Greenleaf Book Group Press called Learning to Lead. I've read it. It's a great read, and we're in the midst of a uh, pretty engaging conversation, and we're going to just keep right on going, if that's okay, Ron. Sounds great. All right. So, you know, we've talked uh, so far about leading yourself and then leading others, and uh, I'd like to maybe shift gears a little bit and talk about leading organizations, because I think that's the rarefied experience that only you and others who've served in the CEO role really can have a, a, a point of view that's a different from those of us who are perhaps fairly along in our leadership careers, but but not in that particular seat. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the turnaround at, at Aetna when, when you became the CEO. So I, I can only imagine to have had that kind of turnaround. There were issues and, and challenges there. And I, I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the, the largest challenges you faced and what you what you did to galvanize the organization? Now you've mentioned a few moments ago about you know traveling to different org- uh, parts of the organization and encouraging people to be candid and to share. Can can you speak more to what you did in those early days as the CEO to to begin to to turn the ship? Sure. Well, one thing that just matter clarity is that when I st- we started to turn around, I was president and then became CEO later. Um, and the CEO at the time was a physician uh, who had run hospital systems and. I, I joke with him that he's a rare physician who uh, understood what he knew, but recognized he needed someone who really understood the operation of the business from uh, an experiential uh, uh, career point of view, and we made a great team. Um, I think one of the things that we had to do was to really develop an understanding of how customers thought about the business. We faced a huge amount of change the whole sector was going through a transition in products and our product set and offerings were geared to what people had wanted before, not to what they wanted now. We also did not have the human capital that we needed and we did not have a culture that was well suited to the success of the business. Given the huge financial losses we were experiencing, there was a loss of pride in the company. Uh, if you went in the community, you asked people where they worked, they would bump, mumble something about health care, but no one would say they worked at, at Aetna. And I think what we had to do was really renew and, and create a culture for the company that was a positive, high performance culture. And we spent an enormous amount of time doing that and creating that culture. And that culture really led to the support, it was a support mechanism that, that was empowered by what we call the Aetna Way, which were the values of the company, with very clear and explicit behaviors that were focused externally on our customers. And so I would summarize it by saying it was about the strategy, it was about the human capital that supported that strategy, it was about the mission, the values that we created, and the culture that really was all about integrating those in a way that helped us get to where we needed to get to. Now, you've spoken a lot uh, about the Aetna way, and you talked a lot in the book about the culture of Aetna, Aetna Nice. And, you know, I would imagine that that uh, speaks, I think, to the willingness of a a lone woman who had courage to say something, (laughs) because that probably wasn't in keeping with what was then the, the... you know, Aetna Nice. 
I think also when you have massive change or, you know, there's serious turnaround that's required, there are maybe other things at play that, that present themselves as barriers. Could you speak to some of those and maybe what you did to kind of get, get past them? Well, I think the, uh, the, 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 the historical context was Aetna was a 150-year-old company. You joined out of high school and you worked there forever. And as long as you didn't do anything extreme, you were pretty much guaranteed a job. Sure. When significant issues were confronted, people found uh, ways to not really address the issue, but just kind of make it disappear. So you'd come back and say, what happened to that project we committed to do? And the answer was, well, we're still working on it. Or it was all kind of, and the term was Aetna nice. So it was, mm -hmm. it was a huge cultural issue. The other backdrop of the company is the company had spent $9 billion on acquisitions. And so the company was now composed of individuals who'd come from six different entities. And when you ask people to tell them, tell you your, their background, the first thing they would say is, well, I'm from Prudential, or I'm from Nile Care, or I'm from this entity. Mm -hmm. And they didn't think of themselves as Aetna. So I think one of the things we had to do was to explain to them that our competitors were very focused on taking our customers, and they didn't care where you came from. That's right. And if we were going to win in the marketplace, we had to unite. And we had to unite behind focusing on meeting the needs of our customers. So a big part of the cultural transformation was really identifying the legacy attributes in Aetna as a 150-year-old company. We built on the positive legacy, reactivated it, and really created the Aetna way with advisory groups around the company to make certain that the language of the Aetna way translated into very specific behavioral actions that each person could understand what they should do and what they shouldn't do to be reflective of the Aetna way. The other thing which I always stress to CEOs is, I spoke to employees usually a couple hundred times a year, recognition events, conferences, things. Every time I talked to the employees, I started with the values of the company. If the CEO does not talk about the values, each and every time they get in front of the employees, they are implicitly unimportant and people behave as if they're unimportant. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, if I've worked at companies that shall remain nameless where there were plaques on the wall with the values and there were times when it wasn't um, a particularly um, easy time and some of those plaques disappeared. I think they just didn't want to say, well, this is what we aspire to. And so you'd see a little hole in the wall for a little while. So it's not a, not a, good, not a good message. Now, I, I know that um, one of the, the concepts you talked about was good enough decision under real world conditions. And there were several elements to that about, you know, getting input from different, uh, from different sources and a variety of other things. Was that one of the hallmarks of, you know, kind of getting the organization to move forward? Was, can you tell us more about that? Yes, well, I think th there are two lessons here. One is you can have decision paralysis. There also is an important lesson for those individuals who are moving from being strong individual contributors to leading a team. Because in that situation, you may in fact be a better analyst than the person who is the analyst on that team. The question is, if they have a 98% solution, are you adding value by stepping out of your leadership role and becoming the analyst who fills in the last 2%? that can be highly demotivating and it's often hard for new executives to stop doing what they were doing and ask themselves is the difference big enough that it's worth me intervening and sometimes it is but often it's not we're simply doing what we used to do That's and right. that is demotivating and causes people to lose engagement in what they're doing the, yeah there's, there's a lot to be said for owning something yes. isn't there Absolutely, and, and giving people that, that, uh, that ownership. Now, in terms of the broader issue, uh, you have to ask yourself, how much better will a decision be if we are going to capture that last 2% of information? Also, is this a franchise endangering decision? Is it a reversible decision, or is it a decision that's not reversible? And so it's extremely important 
to not get paralyzed by seeking every last piece of information as opposed to the, the really relevant pieces. And this was something that uh, the CEO, I initially worked with Jack Rowe, who was a physician, reminded me is that there are endless measurements in the human body. If you know blood pressure and you know the heartbeat, you know an awful lot about the status of the patient. And so uh, I, th I think there's a good analog for us there. Yeah, in, in the book, it's so clear the respect you had for Jack and, um, you know, working with him and uh, so clear. So it, the, the good tag team that you made for a while and then when you then, you know, were at the helm. So, you know, I wonder if there's, um, it, you know, there's a concept in the book that I thought was kind of interesting. It said the rules of the sandbox. So the leader enforces the norms. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I, it's, it's extremely important that uh, we've all been in an organization where politics is rampant, departments are at war, senior executive teams don't agree with each other, uh, sniping and cheap shots are, per, are permitted. You see it in organizations and you often see it when succession is underway at, at the CEO level. The CEO has to be extremely clear as to what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And you have to enforce that as the CEO. What you find is if you don't permit it and you're very clear when it occurs, the level of the politicalization of the organization diminishes substantially. Everyone's got it, you can't extinguish it. But you can certainly have an organization that functions as one enterprise that does not function as separate fiefdoms within the organization. Because as the CEO, it really is your responsibility to guide the entire enterprise. And so the CEO has to really play a very, very active role and has to recognize that if, if the organization is not behaving that way, then there has to be action taken. And this is where this notion of having ways of getting feedback that help you determine whether what you think is happening is in fact happening. This is probably a good place briefly to just talk about culture again because culture is not what the executive suite thinks it is. Culture is what the new employee learns when they go to lunch on the first day and they lean over to their coworker and they say, tell me how it really works around here. The culture is what that person says. And the job of the CEO is to align what they think it is with what that frontline employee is experiencing. And that's so true because you can't fix the culture by working on the culture, right? The, your, the culture that you have is the net result of what you either have done or failed to do. And every culture, I mean, every organization has a culture, it just may not be what you aspire to. But that is that is so true. It's the how things really work around here. Now, Ron, I, I know that you do a lot of work with CEOs and those who aspire to be CEOs. And, and I wondered if, do, do you see a, a change in the kinds of challenges that they're facing or the the barriers that uh, that they might encounter is it is it different now or is it maybe the variation on a theme is a little different but it's pretty much the same thing what what what, what are your thoughts well I think that the, there are new challenges that uh, continue to evolve there's always the challenge of doing today's business today and and achieving the financial and and and, and customer satisfaction requirements to be effective in the market today. Then the CEO has the strategy of where will we be in five years working with the board. Today we've added the whole question of employee engagement. Diversity inclusion is extremely important. It's a job half done. Um, and diversity is about the composition of the workforce. Inclusion is about the culture and how the culture creates a welcoming environment. And CEOs now face the whole social media. We have the Me Too set of issues that have surfaced. And we have the fact that employees are often of different opinions about critical social issues mm -hmm. that now are brought into the workplace that historically were not present there. And expect that CEO to have a point of view and to express it. And not just have a point of view and express it, but to take company action yes. consistent with that point of view. That's right. and on some issues, it's pretty straightforward. On others, 48% want to go left, 48% want to go right, and the CEO is trying to figure out what does that mean in terms of our workforce and our customers and other key constituencies. Yeah, I think a lot of the times when you see a CEO stepping up to speak on whatever issue it might be, 
there's usually a direct linkage to either their product set or their customer base or somehow or other it's you know part and parcel of what that executive is leading so it's it's not easy and it's a minefield very much so and i th- i think it's an area where organizations are learning and feeling their way and all of this is occurring while back to the core issues of the business doing well, creating the right human capital in that business. And I think that's another area where I think we've seen a lot of growth and evolution is the C-suite really becoming much more involved, particularly the CEO, in recognizing that human capital is a true differentiator. Money is, in today's world, much more readily available than ever. And yet, human capital is really the absolute critical element to win. You know, I think so. We're seeing so much of the literature and headlines talking about burnout and needing a sense of belonging. And that's really, like everything else, starts with tone at the top. You know, it's how committed is that CEO to his or her organization and the culture to make sure that the the right um, set of skills are retained, that employees feel belong, that they belong, that they feel included so that they can devote themselves to what could be, what could be, well, how could we make this place better? What could be innovative? What could we do? And you don't get that unless people feel engaged and, and a sense of belonging, committed. You know, to your point earlier about not being as comfortable talking about which company they work for. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's very important. And while the, the C-suite and the CFO and the, the CEO can be very excited about the financial results, most people who work in a company, they work, they, they want to do a good job. They want to buy a new washing machine. They want to send their kids to school. What they get excited about is a clear and elevating goal to make the world a better place where they can connect what they're doing and they can bring that discretionary energy to the job. And that discretionary energy makes a huge difference. I often talk that every employee wakes up every day, they had 10 things on their list to do. Everybody's smart enough to know there are seven that are highly visible to everyone else. Those seven will be done. The other three, whether they do them today, tomorrow, or next week really won't be visible. But if they make that commitment and are engaged and they come in and every day they get those 10 things done, it makes a huge difference. I, I think I think that's spot on. I mean, everyone wants to do things that they feel are important and, and do make a difference. And I don't think very many people wake up and say, how can I really mess things up today? Uh, so I think there's something about feeling as though you make an impact. You work for a company that, that you know, it's a, it's a, uh, you're prideful to, to work there, and you have great faith in the future of the company. And that really all starts from a visionary CEO and the team that he or she builds and goes from there. So, And I think that the communication is just absolutely so important because companies do have to make tough decisions. Yeah. You're growing in one area, but you're downsizing in the other. And I think employees really look, look to the, the CEO and the organization to speak to them plainly about the challenges that are being faced and to be treated fairly and exactly as they can given the challenges that business may, may, may be under. Absolutely. Well, I, I could talk for a couple more hours. I love this space. I loved the book. And I'm so appreciative that you would take some time. But there may have been a question that you said, surely Rebecca will ask this question that I just didn't, that you just thought you know would be great to also highlight in the book. Was there anything that, that you wanted to, to, to mention? Well, I guess probably the, 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 the main thing I would mention is to remember that leadership's a journey mm-hmm. and that all of us uh, start out uh, with aspirations And one of the best ways to achieve those aspirations is to recognize it's a journey, recognize that that you're never done, and that we all think about the rewards and recognition of a promotion and the opportunities. We don't often think about the obligations that go with it. And so I always encourage people on that journey, think about what you're signing up for in terms of the positives, but also think about the new obligations that you're taking on. And the journey should be fun. You should really enjoy what you do. Well, Ron, you've certainly given everyone a great roadmap for the journey. So thank you for the book. And uh, thank you also for for spending some time with us. And I'm so appreciative that you would share uh, the highlights from the book. I encourage everyone to pick up a copy and, and read it. But thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. 
Well, folks, if uh, if if you've enjoyed uh, this uh, podcast from the uh, Off the Shelf series, I'd encourage you to sign up for uh, for our entire series. We do a broad range of these podcasts over time, uh, ranging from subjects in governance and human capital, business and economics. So we we really hope to bring you the very best thinking, the very latest thinking. And just as a as a reminder, uh, Ron Williams' brand new book, Learning to Lead from Greenleaf Book Group Press is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And I I would encourage you to take uh, a a look at this book because it's a great read. This is my space. I read a lot of these books. This one was so accessible and so chock full of insights. I think you'll enjoy reading it. Thanks again for joining us and I hope to see you on the next podcast.